All right, welcome back to our Intro to Biblical Hebrew. We started something last session that we're going to finish today. We have some uh, unfinished business with the nouns. Uh, the foundation we laid last uh, session in our, our last chapter in the textbook is going to be really important for us because we're assuming we already have that under our belts, um, but now we're going to kind of develop it a little bit. So that, that table on page 71 is going to be really important, that uh, masculine... Uh, feminine nouns in the singular, plural, and dual. So those patterns of sus, susim, susayim in the masculine, and then the feminine was susa, susot, susatayim. Those are our patterns that we need to know. Now we're going to focus on is um, not uh, anything to do with the endings, but what can happen earlier in the word in terms of vowels. Um, that might change when we add one of those endings from uh, our inflected noun paradigm. So here again, we're um, looking at something new, but we're doing that by building on something old. So this is a good chance for us to review some of those things in the noun system, as well as look at them a little bit more closely. So that's really the order of the day, is looking again at that chart, but perhaps looking at it with a few different examples of nouns that have some changes in vocalization. So once again, we find ourselves in one of these topics that gives us a chance to uh, review and try to kind of refresh something old and apply it somewhere new. That was true of that noun um, master paradigm that we just um, just heard, that one on page 71 in the textbook. But it's also true here for syllables because uh, we're going to be using some terms that we picked up recently to describe certain phenomena that happen in uh, within nouns when we add those endings. So... Up top, why don't we just uh, do a quick review of those terms so we're all on the same page. Um, if you remember, we said that a Hebrew noun, the default position, unless there's an accent marked, uh, marked otherwise, will be um, that we'll have a, our, our accent on the final syllable. We'll emphasize that final syllable. And for that reason, we've been calling that the tone syllable or the tonic syllable. Now, right before that, um, we had a syllable one step back. Surprise, surprise, that's the pre-tonic syllable, right? That was the tone, then the pre-tonic, and one step further back from here was the pro-pre-tonic. So we said most often our Hebrew words will be uh, consist of up to three syllables. Most often they'll have an accent on the final syllable, and then we work our way back to the pre-tonic and pro-pre-tonic. So that's something we've touched on, and if that's settling in, great. Uh, if not, you can go review that, because we're going to want to know what those terms are for when it comes to understanding some uh, patterns that we'll see, some patterns for variation, in fact, in the way uh, uh, nouns will inflect when we add our endings. So what we can look at now is in the bottom here of the screen, what we've got are um, two patterns that would be worthwhile reviewing to make sure we know these. Um, because we'll see some changes happen uh, when we are dealing with nouns in the plural. The noun endings aren't what we're talking about. Now we're talking about, uh, in fact, is the uh, some slight changes that can happen in vocalization when we add endings. Quite often in Hebrew, we're going to find that when we add endings to a noun, um, these heavy endings like im or im here, uh, which should be an im, there should be a yod in there, what happens is that impacts things earlier on in the word. It draws the accent, throws it forward, so that when that happens, sometimes what we'll see are changes to the vowels earlier on in the syllables in a word. So let's look at this first example that we'll call um, pro-pretonic reduction. What we're talking about here are words like davar, that when we add that im ending, if we have in the uh, first position here, a kamitz or a etzere, and there's a few examples of words like that in our textbook. When we add that ending, that kamitz will reduce, and it will reduce to a shiva. So the form davar becomes devarim, and you're hearing that short e, eh, and that's our shiva. It's not davarim, it becomes devarim. And all that uh, we need to know here is, well, uh, it's because we've added that, that ending. Um, think comets or tzere in this position will result in a shortened uh, shiva here. So that's one pattern that we want to know about. Um, the second pattern of changes is similar, but now we're not talking about the pro-pretonic syllable. 
not talking about this one way back here, but the pre-tonic syllable, this one here in the middle. So let's look at this example on the uh, other side of the page here. Uh, we're talking about chauffeite. Chauffeite. Uh, this is our word for uh, a judge. Uh, like the book of judges, um, chauffeim, that's what that book is called. The difference here is, again, we're talking about the pretonic reduction. And the thing to remember with uh, these examples is that uh, the vowel in that pretonic position, this position right here, uh, may reduce, and that may reduce to a shiva when suffixes are added. So we take our, um, our term shofet, there's the vowel we're talking about, and this becomes shoftim, shoftim. Again, we're adding that long ending, and we're getting, um, we're getting a reduction to that shiva here again. So a similar type of reduction, again involving shiva, but uh, here now we're talking about it in the pre-tonic position. So those are kind of two of the main patterns we want to know about. Before we move on, uh, I just want to say again what I'll probably keep saying throughout the semester is let's focus on what doesn't change because what doesn't change here is our vocab. We know davar, for example, and if we know our paradigms, we know im is an ending for a noun, a plural noun. Devarim, then, all you're seeing is that noun, singular noun, plus that ending. What's going on here? Uh, is just something to be aware of. Remember, we're not focusing on composition of Biblical Hebrew, we're focusing on recognition. So a lot of these words, that, or a lot of these rules rather, that we're um, walking through are things to be aware of, things that change, um, that might look different from your vocab or your endings, but they're not things I think we need to, to drill, again, because we're focusing on recognition. So that's two of the patterns that we're going to look at. Uh, we've got a few more things in this topic to, to work through before we call it a day, so why don't we move ahead. Here we have one more um, pattern that we're going to look at for noun vocalization. I want to be aware of this because it relates to that other class of nouns we learned about recently, those, those segulate nouns. Uh, so remember, these are, uh, are nouns that uh, we're talking about here, like melech, king, or na'ar, um, servant. These are those nouns that typically will have two segels together like this. Um, that's what they're called, segulates. But we can also remember that when we looked at these earlier, we can also have two patoks, and that patok pattern will be there if, uh, if a guttural is present in the root, like our ayin for na'ar. So that's our review. We're talking about these vowels that have that pattern of segel, segel, or in the case of a guttural, patok, patok. Now regardless of that pattern, uh, if we have the paired segels or the paired patoks, when these nouns are inflected, uh, we get some, some changes earlier on that are consistent uh, across the board. So let's look down at the bottom of our screen and we'll, we'll map this out. So there we have our, our plural forms, melachim, ne'arim. And what we're seeing in both cases is in the propretonic position, we get a shiva. We get a shiva in the propretonic uh, position regardless of if it's a segel or a patach. Following that, uh, the second thing we see is um, we get this comments. Me, la, him, ne, arim. Both of those segulate patterns that we saw up here um, result in that shiva plus comments uh, before we add our endings. One kind of caveat to this we could add, uh, and our textbook deals with a few examples like this, is if we had uh, a guttural, uh, say we had a guttural in this first position, like our word edits, uh, then one other rule we want to remember is that uh, this position, uh, for a guttural, we can't take a regular shiva. We need to have our compound shiva. Uh, so that will show up differently if we had a guttural letter. Uh, in, in a word like edits, it would become aratzot, for example. Uh, and you can have a look at a few of those examples in our textbook. But between the last slide, those two patterns, and this pattern for segulate nouns, that covers most of our bases for noun patterns. Again, know the vocab, know the endings, and be aware of some of the things that you can expect to change along these lines earlier on in the syllables for a noun when it's inflected. Right, Ross walked us through a few more things we can expect to see that happen to uh, some monosyllabic words. So these are our words in Hebrew, our nouns that consist of just a single syllable. 
Uh, we've got a few of them here. Sus, our paradigm word. Am, for people. And Ra, uh, evil or wickedness. I don't want to spend a ton of time here, but just I want to give us a few of these examples, more or less, to reiterate what uh, is, I'll probably keep saying all semester. Focus on what doesn't change. Be aware of some of these peculiarities. Uh, lean on Ross and his um, examples, and we should be fine. But since this is part of our, our chapter for the week, uh, what do you want to know or at least be aware of? There's three things that uh, we could probably just remind ourselves of or bring to our attention. The first one has to do with uh, words like Seuss. Um, Seuss, our word for horse, we've seen this a million times now. Seuss is one of those nouns um, that would be a CVC in this uh, original uh, lexical form. And that CVC has a long vowel. Now that long vowel is our shudik, and when this is inflected for uh, horses, it becomes su seem. And really all we're seeing there is the, um, our regular endings added to the noun. But the result is this becomes CV and CVC. So what do you need to know here? Nothing changes. It's just a change to the, uh, the way the syllables break down in a word. But what are you seeing? You're still seeing the vocab word sus and our endings im. Um, no big deal, just focus on what you already know, and that change in the uh, syllable breakdown shouldn't throw you. So that's our first thing. The second uh, are words that have a short vowel, like um. Our short vowel, uh, patach, in words like this. Um, what we'll see when we inflect this for our plural uh, is a, a dagesh here. And we will uh, also see um, uh, a change to the, to the vowel here in this case. But the main thing that we want to at least realize is that that doubled, um, that dogish forte that shows up in the mem is simply because we have a monosyllabic word. That's just something to be aware of because already we're learning about dots and dashes all over the place and we're asking questions about why is that one here. Uh, it's because it's a monosyllabic word. But again, if we focus on what doesn't change, ah meme, uh, or rather, ah meme. Let's do that correctly. We have our vocab word, uh, and we have our endings. No big deal, focus on what doesn't change. So that's our second example. Uh, let's look at the last one. Here we have really a subset of that uh, previous rule, uh, or thing that can happen. Um, here we've got an example when we have a guttural in the second, as a second letter. Uh, in this case, ra, we have a guttural um, ayin. One thing we've learned about gutturals is they can't take a doggish forte. Uh, one thing we learned about um, a similar situation like this with our definite articles is they will quite often, um, to make up for that, they'll lengthen the previous uh, vowel. That's that compensatory lengthening. So that's an old rule uh, applied somewhere here again. These are all things that I think are helpful to know about, but focus on what doesn't change. Vowels, endings, know the paradigms, and you'll be able to make sense of these verbs and you won't be thrown off by um, the odd doggish that's added in in some examples or a lengthened vowel in others. All right, here we are at our last item on the docket uh, today. We're going to look at a preposition. Uh, one small word that um, uh, is important for us. We're going to be looking at the preposition min. So far, we've learned a few prepositions uh, from our vocabulary list. We've start, learned some that, that stand alone in a sentence. Uh, we've also learned uh, about those three inseparable prepositions, that b, l, and k, those ones that only exist when they're added to the front end of a word. Now we are going to look at min, uh, and we're going to see that it can behave in both ways, so it's going to fit in both of those worlds uh, in some ways familiar, but then we'll also see that it has something, a new quality uh, that we haven't touched on yet. So the preposition min is what we're talking about. And its basic form, uh, as we're seeing here on the right, uh, min, and the meaning that we're going to attach to this, for the most part, would be from something or some of something. Now, when we coordinate this with a noun, there are two basic ways that min can behave. The first one uh, is like this, with a, a makef, uh, from a king, min melech. Remember, the job of the makef was to show that two things are closely to re closely related. Uh, that's what we're getting here, min melech, uh, from a king. 
in that way, it's somewhat independent, even though it's got the MACF. So we'll see that, um, see that quite commonly. Now, the second option is where things um, look a little more like what we saw with our inseparable prepositions. Min um, can join uh, inseparably with a noun, but what we see here uh, that's different for us is something called assimilation. The assimilation, that what that term means, is our form min that we're seeing here. When we're adding that right into the front end of a noun, that min will in fact uh, disappear. It won't be represented, at least not as a letter. Rather, it will be represented as a dogish in the first consonant of the noun. Mimelech, from a king, means the same thing uh, as min melech, uh, joined with the makef. Two ways of saying the same thing. Now, one thing to note uh, is that that uh, example that we just looked at there works quite easily because we can see the dogish uh, in that first consonant. Now, what about those one guttural nouns? If you're getting the feeling that gutturals um, cause some problems, they do, but the solutions we're finding for gutturals are pretty similar. Uh, on our last slide, we talked about compensatory lengthening. We talked about that already last week, or a few lessons back, rather, with the um, definite article. Here, we see the same thing. Now, if we wanted to add min uh, to the front end of our word ish for man or human, obviously that uh, olive isn't going to take our dogish. So what we're going to see is what we've already seen. Uh, we're going to see that lengthen. Here, we're going from a hitik to a tsere. Me ish, me ish, from a man. So what we need to know there, again, is our vocab. Um, so if we know what's going on on this side of the word, and we know something of the rules about assimilation, as well as we're aware of how gutturals can behave, then me ish um, should, be, uh, should be something we can at least grow into. There we're kind of layering two or three things we need to know to make sense of the form. Um, but no min if we can pick up on this idea of assimilation and then know our vocab, then we're there. Now, one place where this will, um, will affect things is in situations like this. And this is where we'll end off for the day. So if we reverse engineer this word, we kind of start from the back end of it. We have melech, which is our, our word for king. That's our noun, our vocab item, no problem. The ha melech would be the king. And what we're seeing in that um, configuration is our patak, great, our he, and our dagesh, all three items that we are looking for for our typical pattern of the definite article. Now, if we wanted to say from the king, we have to add min on the front end of that word. Min, unlike the inseparable prepositions, won't um, kind of join forces uh, with the definite article he. It will be attached in front of the definite article he. And because he is a guttural, then we're going to see that compensatory lengthening here. So this is really the same concept uh, that we saw in Me'ish, only now we're applying it to examples where we have definite nouns. This would still be from the king because the he is a guttural letter. So min are inseparable prepositions, are independent prepositions. They're all operating in the same world. But for today, the new idea that we heard about was assimilation. Uh, so we'll warm up to that, and we'll see that even later on in the semester when we deal with verbs.